But if you're in um, 2 Thessalonians, uh, we'll read out of uh, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 and begin in verse 1. Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and by our gathering together unto him, that you be not soon shaken in mind or be troubled, neither by spirit nor by word nor by letter as from us, as if the day of Christ is at hand. Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition, who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped, so that he as God sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Remember ye not that when I was yet with you, I told you these things. And now you know what withholdeth, you know what withholdeth that he might be revealed in his time. For the mystery of iniquity doth already work, only he who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way. And then shall that wicked be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth, and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. Even him whose coming is after the working of Satan, with all power and signs and lying wonders, and with all deceivableness of unrighteousness, in them that perish, because they receive not the love of the truth, that they might be saved. And for this cause God shall send them strong delusion, that they should believe a lie. And they all might be damned, whom believe not the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. That we, But we are bound to give thanks always to God for you, Brethren, beloved of the Lord, because God hath from the beginning chosen you to salvation through sanctification of the Spirit and belief of the truth, whereunto he called you by our gospel to the obtaining of the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, brethren, stand fast and hold the traditions which ye have been taught, whether by word or our epistle. Now our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God, even our Father, which hath loved us and hath given us everlasting consolation and good hope through grace, Comfort your hearts and establish you in every good word and work. Let us pray this morning. Our Heavenly Father, Lord, we're thankful for the day and for what you've given to us. And Father, we're thankful for the time that we have. And Lord, I ask that you might help me this morning, that you might fill me with the power of your spirit, help me to convey the message that you've laid upon my heart. And Father, I pray that it might be understood by those that are here this morning. And that Father, you just might use it and uplift and encourage. And Father, help us to... Uh, uh, not only to know the truth of your word, but Father, that we may stand steadfast looking for your coming and that, Father, we might live faithfully until that time. Father, again, we thank you for all that you do. Bless the class in the back and we ask it all in Jesus' name, amen. As we think of uh, this particular subject, and again, I've entitled my message, The Rise of the Beast. This being the first part, we'll look at the man of the Antichrist. Next week, his, his methods and his mark uh, will be in the book of Revelation chapter 13. Uh, if you want to read that this week, uh, and that is where it talks about the mark of the beast and his number, uh, 666, uh, you know, uh, forever that uh, I, I've seen people, uh, they've turned down change uh, uh, because it came up to that number. Uh, your receipt comes out to that. It's like, oh, you got to add a penny, do something different. They get a little superstitious about that number. I had my phone number one time was 1666. Uh, it didn't bother me a little bit. I, I, I see it a little different. Uh, not that I'm, I'm portraying that number. It's been sung about and uh, in or actually in music and other things, and they've they've done that just as a form of uh, again because it's anti-society and uh, the reason they promoted it and all those things they did just to get some attention, probably sell some albums uh, to do those kind of things. It's always been one of those things they've thought about, and again we've seen a lot of myth and stuff about this particular stuff, but the Bible says it is truth, and we need to understand. And why do we study prophecy? As a matter of fact, 2 Thessalonians, I think, gives one of the best examples of why we need to know some of these things. And uh, the first one is being because he said for truth. These people at Thessalonica had been deceived. Uh, they had been told some different things. Paul writes trying to set some things straight. He said, I told you about it. You had had some bad information, and now you're a little deceived. You're a little confused. And so there is a truth in the Word of God, and we need to know that truth. But we need to be careful that some people get carried away with it. That's all they focus on. That's all they study is they study prophecy and they do those things. We, we need to have a balance and stuff, but we need to know and understand because it is recorded in God's word and we want a, a good knowledge of all of God's word. And secondly, it helps us to know God's program. Things are coming and there are things to come. Uh, as the famous book that was written about those subjects, uh, things to come. And we look forward to, again, because those promises involve you and I as believers. We've got a lot of things to 
come, as we might say for us, our home in heaven, our uh, transport to glory, our return with our Savior uh, to rule and reign with him and in his kingdom. I mean, there is much laid out ahead for the believer and even for the unbeliever. We are to know God's program. And uh, because again, if we know God's program, uh, the third thing, it'll help us to stand fast, as he said in verse 15, because we can help others, because hopefully it'll motivate us to tell others about Christ, because there's bad days coming. Even if we think we're in bad days now, there's bad days coming. And uh, we need to prepare them for those things to come. They need to know the Lord. They need to understand that salvation uh, provided through Christ on the cross of Calvary that is the only way to have a man's sins forgiven. And they need Christ because if, he, uh, uh, if the, the plan of God, uh, when it takes effect, uh, unfortunately, there may not be room at that time. And maybe not room, there may not be opportunity, I guess I should say. Uh, and a lot of those things even discussed here. And so, um, again, it's uh, the time is now to know the Lord. But as believers, we want to stand fast uh, in the ways of the Lord, realizing that his coming is soon. And we're closer today than we've ever been. And we're thankful for that. And we look forward and pray for that coming because, again, we'll be taken from the sin-cursed world and uh, headed to our home forever with our Savior. So, so what a glory it is for us as believers. But let us take a look at this, uh, this man of sin. He was mentioned here in 2 Thessalonians. You'll actually find him mentioned several places in your Bible, and I'm just going to touch on some of those. And a lot of this stuff I won't have time to explain today. Hopefully in times past I've covered some of these things, maybe not all of it. I, I think I've at least mentioned it in some places. It's been a while ago. I may have to preach on some of this stuff a little more uh, in, uh, in death in the future. But he was prophesied in Daniel chapter 7. And uh, Daniel would see a vision and actually Daniel would be shown God's timeline. And he would be shown the judgment to come upon Israel. And it was a judgment of, of weeks, 69 uh, uh, particular weeks. And that 70th week, you'll sometimes hear uh, that referred to. That one is yet to come. That's the great tribulation that we're uh, heading toward and stuff. But Daniel would see these kingdoms that were raised up and God would actually give him the interpretation of that. He would see all this particular thing and he would see the kingdom of Babylon. It was represented by a lion. He would see the kingdom of Medo-Persia, which was represented by a bear, the kingdom of Greece that would overtake it, represented by a leopard. And you'll even see some of these same things mentioned uh, in the book of Revelation as that. And then a fourth kingdom that was not mentioned by name, but most people feel that that was the kingdom of Rome that was present in the time of Christ and that would take over and again, their control of the world. And then you'll actually see a fifth kingdom to come, or at least I feel uh, he'll have a kingdom. He'll rule for a while and that'll be the kingdom of the Antichrist. And so we'll at least see that and he'll actually come out of some of that. There's a lot there, uh, again, that we won't take time, but Daniel chapter 7 and 11 sort of speaks of when he will come and he'll have a king. And, but even there, think about that. His kingdom will be short-lived as far as that because there is a kingdom that come that will have no end that will take his place and the kingdom of God will come. But the Antichrist in Daniel chapter 7 and verse 11, it was said that he would speak great things. It was also said that his body would be slain, that he would be destroyed and uh, even cast in hell. And the Bible uh, uh, records all that in the book of Revelation. Uh, we know his end. We know everything about him, really. Maybe not everything about him, but we know, again, God's timeline for him. And yet uh, Satan will still attempt thinking he can win. You have to understand Satan's mindset. It's always been about pride. It's always been about uh, taking over. And even all that we know in the word of God, uh, knowing the victory that believers have at the end, Satan doesn't believe that. He still thinks that he can overtake uh, the things of God. And he's the prince and the power of the air. Understand, let us never underestimate the power of the devil uh, because he is mighty. And as far as what he's able to do and the control that he has in this world, but yet our Lord and Savior and our Heavenly Father, they are mightier than him. And the day will come when he will be put away and sin will be put down. This Antichrist is also called the little horn, he's referenced to that in Daniel chapter 8 and verse 9 and also through the book of Daniel because it speaks of a horn, uh, again, a power figure coming out of some of the other kingdoms and again, those things, and there's a lot into that. Revelation chapter 13 even makes a reference to that and you see that when it talks about those horns, it's actually talking about, uh, it speaks of the ones on the animals, but it talks about taking 
uh, some control and having power there. But one of the titles given to him, the little horn, and uh, you'll see that in the book of Daniel. And again, sort of running through some of this, just to give you an idea, because we're going to speak primarily out of Thessalonians here for a minute. He's also referred to, or at least the event that he causes when you read your Bible, the abomination of desolation, Matthew or Daniel chapter 9 and verse 27. It's prophesied in there. Uh, and I'll read that one to you, chapter 9 and verse 27 of the book of Daniel. And it said, And he shall confirm the covenant with many for one week. And in the midst of the week, he shall cause the sacrifice and the oblation to cease. And for the overspreading of abominations, he shall make it desolate, even until the consummation. And that determined there shall be poured out, poured upon the desolate. That particular passage will also be referenced. And Jesus in Matthew chapter 24, when he's talking about future events, tells the Jews, when you see the abomination of desolation, and that is when the Antichrist will set himself up in the temple and he will claim himself to be God and he will desire to be worshiped as God. Now, that presents one problem in your Bible. There's no temple right now. And again, I've mentioned that before. That's why that spot of land in the nation of Israel and in Jerusalem is very important for Christians to watch. And even what gets done with it, the wailing wall where they go, that wall and the area just above that, uh, the Muslims have control of that at this time. The Jews given a little bit of leeway, but they don't have, they can't erect a temple on it. They can't worship there. But someday all that will be taken care of. And it'll be interesting to see when it comes. They've already got all their stuff, if you will. Uh, you can search some of that. Uh, find pictures of it. They've got what they need. They're going to rebuild a third temple and that third temple will be necessary for the Antichrist to fulfill this particular portion of scripture. But those things are yet to come. And so as a believer, we watch some of that in the world. We may see some of that uh, before we're taken out. But uh, again, he's referred to the abomination of desolation. You read about in Je Daniel 9, 11, and 12, uh, Matthew 24, verse 15 through 18. And it actually, that happens three and a half years into that time period we call the tribulation. It's a seven-year time period. And uh, he'll set up in the middle of that, and it'll be in that third temple, but he'll set up to be worshipped. And uh, that's exactly what he is. That's what Satan wants. They desire to be worshipped like God is. They want to be in that place. And even when you look at the fall of Satan, that's everything he ever wanted. He wanted to be above God. He attempted when he was Lucifer, the anointing chariot, he wanted to ascend above God and therefore he was cast out and cast down. The prince of the power of the air, he still wants to do that. He still thinks he can. And uh, the Bible declares that, but again, in the end, our God is victorious. So when we look at the Antichrist, a lot about him and uh, can't fill that in, but just to give you a quick time frame, you and I are looking forward to that catching away of the church, that calling out, uh, many times we call it the rapture. The church will be taken out. And we believe in that because, again, we're taken out before the wrath of God comes upon this world. After that, there will be a seven-year time period called the Great Tribulation. And the Jews will be drawn back to God during that. And so you'll see this man highly involved with setting peace up with the nation of Israel. And then he will, again, set up in the temple to uh, to take the place and uh, to where they are actually worshiping God, he will set his image up and then him up to be worshiped as God. But let's look at his time to come and what Thessalonians says as Paul writes unto this church at Thessalonica to try to set something straight with them. And Paul says that this time will come after a falling away. And that uh, that falling away, just, uh, it, it, the Greek word there is uh, means apostasy. And we find that it means a defection or a revolt. And we see a falling away. And, and uh, you will actually see that probably uh, after the church is taken out. It'll, uh, uh, it'll come in uh, uh, maybe a, a quick sense. But even today, we have seen a falling away, if you will, from the things of God. We've seen churches fall away. Matter of fact, there's a lot of them anymore. Uh, they don't uphold the word of God. They surely don't attempt to preach it. They don't attempt to teach it. Uh, they've done everything but uh, uh, go around in circles. Uh, they've truly fallen away from the faith, if you will. There's many who claim the name of Christ that uh, they don't preach uh, uh, the gospel in any shape, form, or fashion. 
Uh, they've got into telling men what's good for them or what they want to hear. They've got into uh, just trying to be a social club or a, uh, more of a civic group or some uh, group that will go around and do good things. And we've got away from what the truth of the church is. And so we can say in Christianity in general, there's been a falling away and that there has been an apostasy. We see that in our day. It will only get worse. And especially after the the church is taken out. And I think even in this passage, when you read down, the one thing that hinders the Antichrist and the work of that from taking over is because of the power that holds it back. And I think when you read through that and you see that and it speaks of the one, it says in verse seven, who now, uh, he who now leadeth will lead until he be taken out of the way. I think that refers to the Holy Spirit. And I think because of the Holy Spirit in the church, things are held at bay until they'll be taken out. And I think when the church is called out in the rapture, they'll be taken out. And then the Antichrist will have rule and Satan will have nothing to hinder him. And uh, again, we believe in a pre-wrath, pre-tribulation, uh, taking out, catching away rapture of the church. But if we believe in that imminent return of Christ, you know, we have to realize that the man who is the Antichrist is alive on the earth now. You know, now a lot of people, if you ask them and go around... Uh, there's a lot of people, if they say, they've got a name for somebody. Uh, every now and then it'll come up, and especially if you search some of that, they've picked out some people who are prominent or whatever. Just understand that God can take whoever, not necessarily God, it'll fulfill the prophecies. Satan can empower whoever, raise them up to be what they will be. And uh, again, they'll come out of a lot of the things with the mini fill. They'll come out of the revived Roman Empire, out of the Europe and some of that area, and some of the things they'll do. But we're going to look at a few things about him real quickly this morning to just give you that. But understand, uh, a lot will teach that it'll be somebody evil in the past, like a Judas. Uh, some might even throw out whenever we think of evil people, we always uh, Hitler's name it and far down the list. It's not going to be somebody who's already lived. Again, you got to look at the principles of the God's word that everybody has a place of death, a place that they die, and they die once. They'll die a second death uh, spiritually if they didn't know the Lord. So it's not a reincarnated evil man. I think it's a new man, somebody that uh, will be raised up, filled with Satan, and he will be Satan's Superman. So his time is coming that he will have a time in the world during the tribulation. He'll, he's living now, but once the church and the Holy Spirit are taken out, his reign will come. The first three and a half years of that seven-year tribulation, he'll do nothing but promote peace. He'll be the answer man. He'll be a charismatic man. He'll sign peace uh, agreements. He'll be the one who has the answer for all things. He'll sign peace with Israel. He'll sign peace with the world. And that's why we see the forerunning of all that today. Because what does everybody talk about? Peace in the Middle East? Everybody wants it. This man will actually save Israel at one point because uh, Russia and some of the other countries there identified in scripture, uh, they'll try to invade Israel. He'll actually uh, fight some of that off for them and he'll uh, protect them to some degree. And that's why, again, they'll the Jews at that time will buy in. He'll probably help them to restore their worship. He's gonna be their friend for three and a half years. And then that abomination of desolation and his true character will come out. But he's considered uh, a man of sin if we look at his person. And uh, in this particular passage, he's given that title and he's called the man of sin in verse three. And when we look at him, he is simply full of lawlessness and he leads the apostasy and he is empowered by Satan. Uh, like I said, we draw a picture of him as probably somebody who is very uh, charismatic, uh, very able to lead, very able to convince people. But in three and a half years, he will turn uh, completely evil. And again, he will be that person that by his very methods and later on his mark, and that's what we'll look at uh, in our next lesson next week, uh, by those things he will control and not only control the world and the economy, his uh, side person, if you will, which completes the Holy Trinity. They sometimes refer to him as a beast too. Uh, oftentimes we call him a false prophet. They'll run the religious world at that time, whatever it may be. And uh, they will really, Satan will truly have his holy, unholy uh, trinity that he mocks really everything that God ever did. Matter of fact, there's some question that uh, this uh, Antichrist, uh, that he'll be wounded and some think he'll be sort of resurrected or healed back to life. Uh, a lot of questions concerning that. 
and things you can study out. And uh, some folks uh, uh, particularly see that. Uh, not sure about, uh, again, some of those things, uh, just uh, uh, where you feel, but uh, uh, reading that. But there's a lot of things about what they will do or what Satan does to put this man into a place. And remember that Satan has a lot of power in this world. If you remember the uh, magicians and the uh, those of Egypt that were part of Pharaoh, they could do a lot of the same plagues that Moses, or the same things that Moses was able to do. The power of Satan is real. And let us, uh, let us not downplay it. Again, as a Christian, we have great victory over that, but let us not downplay it. And when Satan is let loose and let go, this is what happens. The man of sin empowered by Satan. He's called the son of perdition. And you see that again in verse three, destined uh, to destruction is what that means. Literally son of destruction. And uh, Judas was referred to as a son of perdition. And that's why many people say that Judas will be reincarnated to be the Antichrist. I don't see that. But again, uh, uh, they carry that same title, a son of perdition. He's gonna be revealed to the world. And uh, that's uh, interesting that he has a revelation that he will be revealed in his time. That's why I'm saying, I think he's living now. Satan will bring him up at the right time. He'll be revealed to the world. I think he comes with a message of peace. I think he'll be an answer man. He'll oppose God. Notice in verse four, it said, opposeth and he exalteth himself above all that is called God. That says nothing, but he's full of human pride, full of, again, everything that Satan was when he was in heaven before he was cast out. And he's still full of it, full of everything that says, I want to be above God. I want no one over me, no one to control me. And that's exactly where he wants to be. He is, uh, again, his thing. He opposes God. He exalts himself above God. And if you continue reading there, this verse is sort of full of, of information about him. He says, or that is worshiped. So he desires to accept the worship that is due God. He wants it for himself. And he goes on to say, or that verse goes on to say, so that he as God sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. That is his future place. He'll sit in that third temple in the middle of the tribulation and say, I am God, worship me. What a place that is. What a powerful person that will be. What a horrible person that'll be. And the persecution will come. The mark, uh, if you don't follow, matter of fact, that mark's not even just as much about buying and selling. It's a mark of allegiance as well. It's a mark of acknowledging and coming to and worshiping this man. He exalts himself above God. He'll accept worship as God. And remember that we are commanded in scripture and even back in what Moses gave, or to have no other gods before the true God. We serve the true and living God. He's all that we should worship. He's all that we should, uh, again, put first in our life. And we have to understand where the Antichrist wants to be. But again, it's following his master who Satan will put him there. And so uh, in that third temple, again, that's future. We haven't seen it yet, but it's amazing at the talk that goes on concerning that piece of land over there. It's interesting to watch. We might even see it in our lifetime before we go out. We might even see that be given back to the nation of Israel. Even when you think about it, our country putting an embassy back in Jerusalem, all the things that goes on there, you even see a turning to the nation of Israel coming back and wanting that. And if peace ever is drawn, the Muslims and Jews may share some of it. But again, you'll see worship on that temple mount by the nation of Israel return. And it'll have to return before these events. Again, uh, following the plan of God, things can be set up in an instant overnight, but it's interesting to watch. But it tells us in this passage that the mystery of iniquity works now. There's evil in this world now. Boy, if we look around, if you, and I don't know that watching a lot of the news is good for you right now, uh, but again, you wanna be informed, but you see the chaos going on in our country. And a lot of it, but you think of the unrest, you think of the ungodliness, and uh, you think of all that's going on and what a, what a chaotic place it seems like that the world, not just our country, but around the world is. And truly, what if one could stand up and say, I've got an answer and I've got peace. And he brings the promise of that, not through a peace that's 
an inward peace that, that we're promised through the Holy Spirit, promised through a relationship with Christ and having our sins forgiven. But he says, I can bring a peace. And he promises that to the world. Right now, it's restrained by the Holy Spirit in the church. And I believe this passage spells out. He will come and uh, this Antichrist will have great power by Satan, miracles and lying wonders. It says that in verse nine, even him who's coming is after the working of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders. Again, with a false prophet uh, who will uh, run the one world religion and uh, the one world uh, government and control. Uh, again, what a power that'll be and what a powerhouse. And that's what you read about in the book of Revelation and these things will rule during the time of the great tribulation. And it's again, they'll be followed by those who reject Christ. That's a lot what has to do with that mark because they make a choice and they make a choice to serve this man over God because he sets himself up as God. So let us understand that we should never, uh, we never want to set anything before us in the place of God in our lives. And hopefully we understand that, but the world will do that. He will actually, finally, he'll gather the armies of the world together to fight in that battle we read about uh, in the word of God, in the book of Revelation, it's mission in Matthew, uh, but he'll gather the armies of the world to fight the Lord Jesus Christ at Armageddon in the Valley of Megiddo. You can read about that in Revelation 19. Again, Satan coming thinking he can defeat God and the battle will come as the Lord comes back to the earth the second coming is referred. He'll land uh, upon the Mount of Olives. Mount of Olives will cleave in half, but he'll destroy the Antichrist. And he, Jesus will uh, take him there just by the word of his mouth. And uh, matter of fact, what a powerful passage that is in Revelation 19. We see a picture of our Lord uh, mighty in battle as he comes back to take care of the Antichrist at the battle of Armageddon. And so we see him, uh, we know his end uh, because of what scripture tells us. So as we look at this man, the Antichrist, the rise of the beast, we begin to see the, the filling of that, of the things of this world. Because when we look at the atmosphere, when we look at the things going on, it can't help but to see the pieces of scripture start coming to say that this is happening in small bits. And even as we look next week and we find what he controls and we find about him controlling the economy, controlling the things of the world, controlling who one worships, and again, seeking power through peace in the beginning. What a thing that will be when the world decides that that's who they want to worship and they choose him over the Lord Jesus Christ. But it comes back that we study these things and we look at prophecy back to what we said at the beginning, that we know the truth first, that first and foremost, Jesus came to save sinners of who all people are. All that are ever born, you're a sinner, lost and undone without him. And we need the Lord. And we need to come and trust what he did on the cross of Calvary. Believe by faith in what his finished plan on the Calvary was, shedding of his blood and for our redemption. Come repenting of our sins and trust him and find salvation in the Lord. We need to do that so that we might be a child of his. But hopefully it'll compel us to witness, to tell others about, hey, there's bad things coming. And you need not to reject Christ now to be saved while you have a chance. Because even this passage, if you read on, it talks about a strong delusion. And I'm telling you, when the Holy Spirit is taken out, I don't know that, uh, again, there's a lot of debate on this passage. But when the Spirit's taken out, I'm not sure there'll be a desire for men to come to the Lord. And that'll be interesting. I think there'll be a lot of people saved in the Great Tribulation, a lot of Jews saved. But again, it won't be quite the same it is now without the power of the Spirit who convicts and draws and does those things. People need to be saved while they have a chance. And we need to hold on to the Word of God, but it helps us to know God's program that we might stand fast in a strange world and a sinful world, that we might just believe on the Lord and be ready. Paul tried to set some things straight, and he talked about Satan's Superman. This morning, I hope that, uh, again, we understand some things. And we look up. Because Jesus is coming. Let us stand with our heads bowed this morning as uh, we have a time of invitation and we'll uh, go to the Lord in a word of prayer.